<clears throat> Welcome to Straight Talk with Billy Kay. I'm Billy Kaiserling, the mayor of Beaufort. And though Beaufort is a city of only about 12,500 people, um, there are probably 60,000, 70,000 people who live north of the Broad, and I'd hope that those who live south of the Broad see Beaufort as part of their county and as a place they come and go. As mayor, I do my best to try to communicate through newsletters and now through this TV show called Straight Talk with Billy Kay some of the many things that are happening in Beaufort, some of the things the city's doing, some of the things the county's doing, and some of the things some of the various independent organizations in the city are doing. Those who've watched the show, read my newsletters, or know me, <clears throat> know that I'm very proud of my hometown, and I, because I think that Beaufort is probably the best hometown in the world. I'm proud <clears throat> that we uh, have a 10-year plan and a 100-year plan. We know where we're going. We find that with a plan, it's easier to get grant money, and it's easier to try to bring the public in to engaging in the changes that we need to make if we're gonna grow our city the right way so that we don't become anywhere else. But there's one thing that has embarrassed me the four years I've been mayor, and that is a system, a city that wherever you talk to people and ask them to describe Beaufort, they say it's historic. Historic is always the number one identifier. <clears throat> Yet in our 300 years, um, Beaufort, with all of the history, some that is unique to the world, as I wrote in my newsletter about the period during secession, <clears throat> but some that is unique to the world, this community has somehow not been able to sustain a museum. Uh, fortunately, a group, total volunteer group, totally privately funded group, um, emerged, and they call themselves the uh, Beaufort History Museum. And with me today, I have Catherine Lang, who's the, the founder and president of the board of the Beaufort History Museum. Catherine, let's start off, since we're talking about history, before we get into the museum, talking about the history of museums in Beaufort. Well, actually, Billy, it's not quite true that this is the first time we've ever had a museum. Not the first time we've had a museum. The first time we've had a museum we're going to sustain. I'm sorry. Yes, I think this is the first time it can be sustained. But the actual artifacts, most of the artifacts in the museum are artifacts that have been collected since 1939. Of course, a lot of them are older than that, but the, there, a group started a, the Beaufort Museum in 1939. Most of the people who grew up here, like you, remember that museum. It used to be in the arsenal for years, and it used to have, among other things, a shrunken head. We all remember the shrunken head. The shrunken head that everybody wants to know remember. about. <laughs> But at any rate, um, those artifacts belong to the city, as you know, and uh, were in storage until our little group came along to, to ask the city to, man it, to let us manage it. Because I agree with you, and we, I wasn't the only one who agreed with you, that a city like Beaufort, which is so amazing in terms of its history, should definitely have a history museum. It just didn't make sense that it didn't. So we kind of think of ourselves as being, actually our official name is Beaufort Museum. We call ourselves a Beaufort History Museum because it is only about Beaufort history that we deal with. And I should say by Beaufort, I mean Beaufort County, Beaufort, the low country. But uh, there are no longer any shrunken heads or wooden shoes from Holland as there were in the original one because the world has changed. Okay. Well, let me correct myself. <laughs> let me say we've had a museum since 1939. But more of the time than not, notwithstanding a lot of people who worked very hard on it at different points yes, in time, yes. but our history is, our, the artifacts of our history museum have been in storage on ice. Yes. <clears throat> and we've brought them out to try to thaw them out and, and make some sense of them in terms of an organized museum. Um, when Catherine and her group formed, um, they basically spent months and months and months, and they came to the city and they said, you know, you own these artifacts. And though they've been in storage in many places, in some places storage that wasn't safe, <clears throat> where because of climate conditions things right. deteriorated, um, but they came back to us and they, they pled with the city, let us let, give a trust us to take what we can find and, and build on it and start a museum. And about six months later, um, you came back to city council That's and right. said, we're looking for a place to put the stuff. We've got it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, the city hall had a, a rather large um, portion, roughly 
twenty percent of the of the square footage it's of 3, city hall. Thirty five hundred square feet. Thirty five hundred square feet was not being used, um, and we agreed that for a period of time, we would basically give it to you, ask yeah. you to operate a museum there, and now we have the Buford Historic History Museum um, located on the first floor, the main floor um, of city hall. Tell us what you got. Well, before I do that, I just want to. <laughs> Going to correct me again? Correct you again, okay. yeah, because you called me the founder. I was one of the founders. Okay. The, uh, Donna Alley, who was at that point the uh, 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 historic uh, planner for the city, mm -hmm. and Mary Lou Bruton, and the three of us got together and worked very hard. And then we put together a small, small committee, which is now our board of very dedicated people. So it certainly wasn't a, it okay. wasn't a one person okay. operation you're, you're, you're at all. You're a little modest, but Donna, <laughs> Donna, Donna was certainly a key link for the yes, city. Yes, she was. And Mary Lou, quite frankly, before anyone came to me, um, before you mentioned this, before Donna mentioned it, said, there's stuff out there, I know it's out there, we need to find it. There you go. So we'll give, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll thank you, Donna. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Mary Lou. Thank you for being here, Catherine. Tell us, tell us what we have in terms of the museum. Well, first of all, what we have is the most amazing history, a lot of which p even people in Beaufort don't realize. We all know that Jean Ribot came in 1562, but I don't know that everybody knows that that was the very first group of Protestants escaping from pr persecution in Europe to come to America. We all know that the Spanish had actually already been through here first, but I don't know that everybody understands that when they came back after Rabot's group failed, they announced that this was their headquarters for La Florida, uh, and La Florida was from Florida to Newfoundland. So we were, in a sense, as far as the Spanish were concerned, who were the very first people here um, uh, in, in the uh, in Americas, that they, uh, that they were claiming the whole, the whole continent. And the, uh, the headquarters were where Paris Island is now. So uh, the history is amazing. It's remarkable. And of course, everybody does know that, th that uh, um, not only did, uh, you could say that the Civil War started here with the, uh, the secessionists, but so did the Reconstruction start here uh, with the Port Royal experiment. And there's just one first after another. Buford really, to me, is like, if you, w Larry Rowland likes to say that all American history begins in Buford. I think you can make a really good case for that. But you can also, I mean, I would add to that, that if you wanted to set the great American novel someplace, it, Buford would be the place to set it, because all American history really has played out here in all of the great American themes. Uh, Buford was settled, finally, really settled by the English, but they settled it coming down from Barbados, bringing their slaves. So it was a slave economy from the very beginning, which was really how we established a good part of the United States. And the people that were bringing those slaves in, well, they were up in New England, the other, the other end of the country. <coughs> well, you know, it's fascinating. I, I'm reading what I think of as yeah. the Bible of the piece that I'm uniquely interested in, which is, which is Reconstruction. Right. Willie Lee Rose's book, which is, is, I think is the Bible of, of the Port Royal experiment and what happened. And it was interesting when I was reading last night when the uh, Treasury Department, after Beaufort surrendered very early and the war came down, they had two agents and the agents had a, a, a rather uh, strong disagreement because one agent came here to confiscate the cotton mm -hmm. and take it up north. And the other one came up to figure out what are we going to do with the freedmen? Yes. Uh, here we have people who need to learn. They, they clearly have skills, but they don't have certain life skills because in this country they, they didn't need them, whether it's language, <clears throat> whether it's using equipment, or many of the things that were taught at Penn Center and elsewhere. <clears throat> but the conflict between the two is that Mr. Pierce, I believe was his name, uh, who was more the humanitarian, said, don't ship the raw cotton up north, <clears throat> let's put the slaves to work on a salary and let's gin the cotton and finish the cotton and send it up north. And that's why this, this P 
piece of, of Reconstruction is so important is, is back there we had the issues of trade, we had the issues of economic development, we had the issues of what do you do with the freed period. Unfortunately, I'm doing all the talking. We got a break for a minute. We'll be back, and I want to hear what's inside that okay. museum and the future. I will the future. definitely tell you. Okay, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Straight Talk with Billy Kay. <clears throat> with me, I have Catherine Lang, who's the president of the board of the Buford History Museum. If you missed our first segment, it was a little exciting because Catherine, I spent half the time talking and Catherine spent the, half, the other half the time correcting me. <laughs> so when I said she was the founder, she reminded me that Don, Donna Alley and Mary Lou Bruton um, were right there with her and, and the idea actually started when a group of people, of which Catherine was one of only three, said the museum is on ice, we don't, it's in different places, let's try to put together a history museum. They came to the city, the city said, you certainly can become the custodians of the artifacts. They came up with a plan, we then allowed them to build a museum um, in 3,500 square feet of, in City Hall. Um, so I'm gonna let Catherine do a little more talking this time, but Catherine, tell us what people would find, where the museum is, what people would find there, <clears throat> what they can do to help you. Okay, well first of all, where it is, is at 1911 Boundary Street, which is of course the City Hall. The brand new City Hall at the end of, I guess it's not brand new anymore, but the, at the end of Rebo Road. Um, In the scheme of 300 years, it's still brand new. Yes, it <laughs> seems brand new to me. Where there is, among other things, free parking. <laughs> and we are, at the moment, we're open Tuesday through Thursday from 10 to 12 and 2 to 4. We expect to start being open on the weekends very soon. And so you should watch your newspapers for that because that is a big, uh, a big goal. As far as what's in the museum, you can, we start with, uh, if you walk into the museum, you'll see two 50-year-old paintings that, that uh, commemorate uh, Rebo, Jean Rebo's arrival here. But then we also have some Indian artifacts that go back 10 or 12,000 years uh, that are, have been found right here. There, there's nothing that's not, that's not from this area in the museum. Um, walking through the museum, you'll find uh, information and photographs that have to do with the, the Spanish and the French being first coming here. You'll, you'll find a wonderful portrait of an early pirate hunter. Um, you will see some artifacts that have to do with the, the settlement of the colonial period. And uh, among other things, a new thing uh, from that in, that in that period is a uh, model of a 1775 bateau. Uh, the kind that were used during the revolution, as a matter of fact, but they were also used for everything else in those days. And that was the primary uh, transportation. People had horses and feet, of course, but a lot of their transportation, certainly of goods, was by, by water. So that was an important, important element. Um, you will find uh, some of that cotton that Billy was talking about, uh, rice and indigo from uh, the uh, rice and indigo periods. The first Englishmen, as I said earlier, came from Barbados, and they uh, they grew rice, and then um, and then they began growing indigo, because of a young girl uh, uh, in the Charleston area who, uh, at the age of 17, took over her daddy's uh, plantations and decided to import indigo and see how that worked, and it worked fine. Um, but Buford's been a global economy from the very beginning. The rice and indigo were very important, made, made Buford rich before the civil, I mean before the revolution. But then uh, the revolution, um, during the revolution, there was an embargo, uh, certainly on the indigo, and, uh, and the local planters, many of them started off as Tories, although I think most of them became, uh, uh, did become Patriots by the end, by, by the time we were really underway with the revolution, because they were concerned about their trade, their livelihood. A notable exception is uh, Thomas Hayward, who was one of 
the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and he's of this area. Um, he was probably the, the wealthiest planner of all, at least his family were, and yet he was a patriot from the very beginning and fought during the Revolution. So you'll find, find information about him. You'll find him represented in the museum as well. You will see we have a, an overseer's desk from the antebellum period that would have come out of the uh, uh, overseer's office. It's very rustic because the overseer was not very high on the totem pole. That's the guy who uh, managed the slaves. You'll also see some reference to, uh, to uh, um, Robert Barnwell Rett, who was one of the leaders of the secession. And he used to come and meet with the planters here in Beaufort in his brother's house, which is uh, right here in the middle of Beaufort, often called the secession house because they would meet here to plot. And the story is that they actually uh, drew up the articles of secession, even though they were signed in Charleston, they were drawn up here. So moving along, you will, find in, you will find lots and lots that has to do with the Civil War and then the aftermath of the Civil War, uh, Reconstruction and the Port Royal um, uh, experiment. Robert Smalls is represented in our museum, maybe our most well-known hero, really. Um, and of course, everybody knows the story about how Robert Smalls uh, stole stole a ship from the Confederacy and sailed it over to the Union in, out of Charleston Bay. Oh. Ended up as a member of Congress. And ended up as a member of Congress. And as a matter of fact, the thing that's interesting to me about Robert Smalls is that he was the father of public education in South Carolina. He, as a South Carolina legislator, wrote the, leg uh, wrote, wrote the legislation to make, uh, to make public education available to everyone. He had gone through, uh, he, as a slave, he had not learned how to read and write. He had had to hire tutors for himself later on in order to learn how to do that and thought it was very, very important that everybody know how. Uh, and he worked with the, uh, the ladies that founded the uh, Penn School as well as other schools. Um, so he was really important to Beaufort history. Then you move forward, you'll find, you'll find uh, the story of the, uh, uh, the great hurricane in 1892, 93. 93. Yeah, in 1893, you'll find the story of the great fire in 1904. And that was when uh, three little boys uh, snuck a cigarette in a stable uh, on Bay Street and practically uh, burned the whole town down. The oldest was, I think, under 10. <laughs> wow. Yes, it's almost as bad as Mrs. O'Leary's cow, isn't it? But and and coming up to the uh, to the present time, um, you'll see a model of a, of a shrimp boat. Uh, you'll see um, some of the tools that have been used during uh, during the period when uh, we really uh, were dependent on both uh, mariculture and uh, truck farming for to sustain life after the after the. Uh, um, after the hurricane, at that point, actually, we'd ha they were pretty rich again because of the. Uh, Buford's gone through these. It's, it's gone through <coughs> these a lot periods of, of being one of the richest places in America. That's right. It into has. being one, one, of, one the of the poorest. poorest. And the military has played a, a, a strong uh, role in stabilizing our economy. That's with, exactly with the way I would put it. Since the military has come in, and I think that really, really, they, they came in during the First World War, but they really, really built up during the Second World War. So, of course, Paris Island. Um, and that has stabilized. We have, a, we have much more of a middle class than we did Well, at, it's very difficult to pack 450 years, is it? Yeah, Buf it too. This Buf length of time. The city celebrated the 300 years of our charter, but the history, as you've indicated. What yeah. you've done, essentially, is you've set up a framework. Yeah. Now, the task is to fill in the pieces. Absolutely. And that is where people out in the audience yes. might be able to help us. Yeah. Uh, whether it's family artifacts, things you know that could be found. I think someone just found an old stagecoach in a barn. Yes. That, or a private coach in a barn yes. that's going to be restored. That's going to be restored. That's be, exciting. I'd, I'd love it to be in the lobby of City Hall. So would I. But um, anyway, we're running short on time. 
Um, you've got your annual meeting. They've just, uh, the Beaufort History Museum has just handed to city council a, a very ambitious and hopeful uh, business plan for yes. the future. Um, I don't expect, have any reason to expect, they won't stay in City Hall for a while. Um, but Catherine, I think the real issue is, to, for me to stress, this has been totally volunteer. Yes. And it's got to grow. Yes. You've, you've got the framework, but you need the people, you need the members, you need the people to intend, and probably most of all, personally, if you've got 3,500 square feet, we need to find a way to keep it open. Yes. Catherine, you've got 30 seconds. Make your pitch. Okay. Um, if you want to uh, join the mu museum, you can go on our website and do that at www.BeaufortHistoryMuseum.com. Pretty easy. We need money and we need volunteers. We need volunteers to help us stay open because it is totally volunteer at this point. And we would really be glad to see you when you come. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Catherine. Thank you, Bill. And those, those in the audience, uh, please join us. Come to the History Museum. Uh, join. Give them a little money. Tell them if there's some artifacts out there that yeah. can be uncovered because we're in the process of building what is going to be a sustained effort to keep yes. the museum open in Beaufort. Thanks for joining us with Straight Talk with Billy Kay. Mm -hmm.